All right, everybody, we're a little bit late. We were letting the, the crowds filter in. Uh, today is Tuesday. It is like the second to last month of the year, and then we'll be in another year, and we'll see how that one goes. Um, we'll call this meeting to order real quick. we got all commissioners present except for Mike Davis. Um, before we get started, I would like to ask you to stand if you can, and Marshall will lead us in a quick prayer, and Kevin in the Pledge of Allegiance. In the midst of all the challenges we think we face every day, let us take a moment to remember and give thanks for our first responders, medical staff, and military who are serving as we sit. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Okay, so a couple little quick things. First of all, cell phones should be muted, turned off. I just don't want to hear a whole lot of dinging and ringing if we can make that happen. Um, we have kind of a populated menu tonight. One item, item 4C, is listed as a public hearing, but it is not a public hearing. That is just a regular item, so that will not go through the formal public hearing process. Again, that is 277 Front Beach Drive. That's the plat amendment of lots 1, 2, and 3. Um, final note, we are going to do three public hearings. In that public hearing, we'll make a motion to go into public hearing. We'll get a commissioner, I'm sorry, a staff report. Uh, we will give the applicant 10 minutes to speak, and because of the crowds and because of the items, we're going to give the applicant 10 minutes, then we'll have 30 minutes for people in favor to speak, three minutes per person, and you can yield time, then we will give 30 minutes to the opposition to speak, same rules, and then we will close the public hearing and we'll give the applicant five more minutes to rebut as needed, and hopefully it makes sense when we get there. Um, item one, call meeting to order. We can check that one off the list for those keeping tabs. Item two is approval of minutes for the October 12, 2021, um, what's the word, meeting? Has everybody reviewed the minutes? Anybody have any comments on it? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Kevin. Second by Matthew. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. Set those aside. No old business. There is no old business. New business. Item 4A is going to be 201 Front Beach Drive. Parcel ID is 613-3003.000. Bill and Brenda Blackwell are requesting to construct a residence on a legal non-conforming lot. I would assume this to be a wade. It is. That's thank you. Report. Okay. And, um, the property itself, the vicinity, is there on the screen. It is, um, you said it's approval to construct a historically planted legal non-conforming lot. As you can see, if you would flip to the um, survey of uh, the property, Amanda, and if you'd like the third page. There you go. Thank you. Um, the lot is uh, non-conforming in that it is only 95.37 feet wide whereas the R1 zoning district it's in requires a minimum of 100 feet of um, width at the buildable line. So that's a four foot, eight inch deficiency, which is why it is before y'all tonight and we'll go to the, uh, have to go to the Board of Aldermen too. Um, but at least in terms of size, it's uh, over 24,000 square feet, so far exceeds the requirements of the uh, R1 zoning district of 13,500. The main reason, the reason that that um, lots like this go to the Planning Commission is to enable the, um, the city and the Planning Commission to make sure that the parcel has sufficient utilities and sufficient area available for a building and off-street parking. As noted in the report, um, this was sent to the city departments for comment and uh, they had no issues with this. There is, are utilities available. The building department did note that it's in the VE zone and that does limit to as how the uh, the building will be built on it but other than that uh, there are no issues with this that it, uh, it is um, suitable for a building of a first single family dwelling that complies with the side yard setbacks so staff is recommend recommending approval of the uh, building to build on this lot thank you okay um, anything for staff before we open the floor all right, so while less formal, we do try to give the audience a minute or two to speak to any item. Is there anybody that would like to speak about the 201 Front Beach Drive um, application? I usually would ask the applicant if they want to speak first. Is the applicant here? 
and does they want to speak? Does they want to speak? Do they want to see this? Did you want to speak to that application? Uh, we'd like to show you the plan to tell you a little bit about what we wanted to do. Right. Uh, name and address up at the microphone and try to keep it to about three minutes or so, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Blackwell, and my wife Brenda is with me this evening. And we purchased this lot approximately almost six years ago. And we've been paying taxes on it ever since, trying to get plans arranged. Seems like things happened. COVID slowed it down. We've got the final plan with the exception of work and drawing because we came to a stop because of this meeting tonight. Uh, if, Duncan, can you help me hold these up right quick? Showing you that means I don't have the three minutes, so I'll keep talking. <laughs> yeah, all right. So the, the house is 75 foot wide. So this is a room for the parents and the family. There's plenty of room for parking. We're not getting close to the beach anymore. We're going back further to the road. I think it's Beach Hill, the street on the back. So the house is about a little over 4,000 feet on the roof. We think it's a beautiful house. I think it would be a, a nice element to have on Front Beach, and we hope y'all think so too. And I'll answer any questions you might have. I think somebody asked about my address. It's 10 Summerwood Drive, Jackson, Mississippi, 39208. Hope we hope it will soon be 201 Front Beach. <laughs> That's it for me. All right, thank you. All right, was anybody else that wanted to speak to this application? Anybody else? Item A, once, twice, sold. Any commissioners have any thoughts, comments, questions? All right. Um, anybody want to take a stab at a motion on this one? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Uh, recommend approval to construct the dwelling on the historically platted legal non conforming parcel at 201 Front Beach Drive as described in the application. All right. Motion, uh, Allen. Second, Joe. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. So that got approved through us. You will be on next week's. Next week's board will be the final say so. So you're good. All right. Moving right along. Um, item 4B is going to be 3314, 3316, and 3318 Nottingham Road. This is parcel ID numbers 61099105, 106 and 61099058000 brown and mitchell alexander on behalf of singing river health systems is requesting a final flat approval for a replat of lots 58 105 and 106 to the fort bayou estates part four subdivision wade yes okay uh just to refresh your memory uh this came to y'all for a sketch and preliminary plat approval uh, back on august 10th of this year and then was approved by the board of baird alderman on September 27th of 2001. Um, so this is the final plat for the uh, replat of those three lots of that um, area to uh, be transferred to ownership of the hospital to enable them to add, um, add parking spaces for their for their use. Also part of this will be some, uh, all these will be private, will be a fence and other stormwater, stormwater drainage improvements and they will be coordinated through Public Works and the Building Department to a, a building permit. Uh, so that I mean, that is the purpose of, of uh, this final plat. Uh, staff is recommending approval of it. And uh, Nick Gant here, is here if you have any questions as a representative of Singer River Hospital. And that's all I have to say. So uh, any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I have anything for Wade real quick? Yeah, Wade. Uh are there any significant changes from the initial plat? 
None whatsoever. Did it move north at all? Or? No, no, this is the same This is the same as the preliminary uh, plat. The only thing I don't see on here is the access to the substation. The pump station. Uh, then we'll be part of the car construction. Let's see. Yeah. That'll I mean, if you if you notice on it, there's a like a cutout we'll on. Uh, yeah. Okay. That that is that um, pump station, okay. and you see that will it'll be an easement um, for access to that. Yeah, I think Nick, didn't you aren't y'all gonna black out a space for that? Come on up, Nick. Name and address, please. Nick Gant, Brown Mitchell, and Alexander, authorized agent on behalf of Singing River Health Systems. Um, yeah, so the way we're doing this is a little different because they don't own those parcels. We don't want to do improvements until we get the final plat approved, then the hospital owns it, then we'll go through getting construction plans and coordinating all the improvements that uh, drainage crossing and access for um, the sewer department. Okay. So we'll, we'll follow up with construction plans, go through public works. Okay. You're good with that, right, James? You heard it here first, guys. All right. Anything else you wanted to say, Nick? Not unless anybody has any other questions. Does anybody in the audience want to speak to the final plat for the Singing River, or I'm sorry, the Fort Bayou Estate subdivision final replat? Any questions, comments, concerns up here? Any motions up here? Make a motion. All right. Uh, make a motion to recommend approval of the final plat of the replat of lots 58, 105, and 106 of Fort Bayou Estates Park 4 subdivision as proposed in the application and plat submitted with the application. Motion, Kevin. Second. Second. Uh, Matthew, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. All right. Next week, final answer. <laughs> All right, item C is going to be not a public hearing, uh, just a regular old item for 227 Front Beach Drive, parcel ID 61070001.000. James Carter requesting a flat amendment of lots 1, 2, and 3 of the Deibra Bill subdivision. I'm assuming wait again. Correct. Uh, as you can see on the screen, these, this is actually uh, three lots of the uh, Deibra Bill subdivision, which was dates from 1948. And um, the you scroll down to the next one that actually shows the yeah there you go thank you as you can see there is a existing house on lots one and two are there on the west side the left side of the screen and also a house on uh, lot three on the, the right side the house on lot three uh, extends encroaches into the middle of building side yard setback from the side lot line which leads to the uh, what's going on here and that the, that shaded area is being swapped basically from lot two to lot three. And that, in a nutshell, is what is being done here. Um, it does have to go through this process because it is a planted subdivision, but staff is recommending approval of it. In that the while the the lots is currently planted, dated for 1948, don't meet the requirements of the R1 zoning district. Uh, they this will make them more compliant than they, what they are right now. So, from that standpoint, staff's recommending approval of it and um, make it it. We'll glad to answer questions. I got anything? Yes, my question would be, and maybe it's a question for the applicant. Why? Why now? I mean, when, when were those houses built? Why is it coming up? I mean, is there? Mm -hmm. Is the applicant here? Yes. Did you want to come uh, say anything and, and answer why now, if you don't mind? Uh, sure. Name and address at the microphone, please. Bobby Sargent. I'm the landscape architect for the, my client, James Carter, who is in, in, in attendance. Um, the main reason is the uh, well, the owner wants to, my client wants to, to sell off some property to to uh, do some improvements for his land, but also to allow his uh, neighbor and friend, Joe Cox, who is in attendance as well, to be able to expand his property a little bit and build, he's planning to build a new home in the, in the near future. So it's just sort of a swap of the land a little bit. Uh, my client has two lots with a pool on the second lot mostly. And uh, so they're basically trying to come, we're trying to combine that one lot into one for Carter and then Cox getting another 10 feet. So <clears throat> really that's the whole reason. <laughs> 
for, that, for the, uh, so the intent, foot of width. The intent would be to kind of collapse one and two into one lot? Yes. Okay, but that's not being... No, that, that one, it's one parcel now, but they don't have to change the lot lines to do that. It still remains one parcel. So. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, anybody else have anything for the applicant? You might here want to speak either in favor or against. Uh, did you have anything else to say? I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's good. I'll answer any questions. Yeah, I don't think anybody had anything. Um, all right, anybody else want to speak to about this application for or against? I'd like to speak. Uh, name and address, please. Emily Rhinelander, 406 Smith Drive. Uh, Smith Drive is a road that runs behind the subject property. I live on the east end of Smith Drive and McNamee comes in and one of my concerns is if the if another residence is going to be built on that property the road coming in McNamee and both Smith are barely passable now with cars that go in and out and um, I would be concerned of any additional construction going on there that's going to bring more houses and more cars is going to be difficult accessing McNamee because there are uh, there are trees right in the middle of the road and um, that is my concern so I'll answer to the best and I'll you know please if I'm wrong um, I don't they're actually kind of damning themselves in a way from being able to use the new lot too, right? I mean, because they, they would not conform, so they almost can't. It could not be a By separate. Doing, if they didn't do this, they probably could get away with it because it's already platted and whatever, but Correct. if they do this, they really can't. Build right, it. yeah. They're going to lock themselves into a single yeah. functional lot even though it's made up two lots, yeah. Right, and y'all agree I didn't miss yes, it, right? Okay. So there, there shouldn't be a concern of that. Um, okay, well, I appreciate yeah. that clarification. Yeah. All right, anybody else? This is on the front beach, James Carter, lot one, two, and three, D. Abbeville. Once, twice, sold. Um, anybody else have any thoughts, comments, questions? Once, twice, sold. Anybody want to take a stab at a motion? I'll uh, make a motion. We recommend approval of the proposed amendment to the Abbeville subdivision to reconfigure lots one, two, and three as described in the application. Uh, motion, uh, Allen, second. Second. Kevin, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. That'll be on next week's board agenda. All right. All right. So, public hearings. Again, we'll make a motion to go into public hearing. We'll hear from the uh, uh, staff. We'll have a quick little rebuttal for ourselves. We'll give the applicant about 10 minutes. We'll give 30 minutes to the opposition, 30 minutes to the, I'm sorry, 30 minutes to those in favor, 30 minutes to the opposition, three minutes per person unless somebody yields time. Uh, no need to repeat yourself. If somebody says we're worried about traffic and crime, you can just get up and say, I agree with what they just said, and, and it'll be just the same as, as saying it yourself. Um, let's just try one and see how it goes. How about that? Uh, first one will be item 4D, that is going to be 4414 Hanshaw Road, parcel ID is 601-260-70000, it's Carolyn Mitrick, requesting to rezone from R1 low density single family residential to R2 low medium density single family residential. Do I have a motion to go to public hearing? So moved. Motion Matthew, second. second. Gavin and Joe, I'll let you pick Amanda, all in favor? Aye. All opposed. Our Joe first. Um, all right, we are in a public hearing. Is this a way to as well? All right, wait. Okay. Um, first off, uh, just a couple of other kind of housekeeping items. Um, I wanted to note there's an error on page two, the second page of the report, uh, in that the Yeovil um, Place subdivision has 194 lots rather than 234. There was a calculation error due to some uh, odd uh, lot numbering situations with one of the phases. And two, um, we would need a motion from y'all to accept some of the email um, input that was received today. Yeah, I was going to bring up, well, you got, uh, so we, we, after the report came out, you should have got a second email that had a, after the packet came out, you got a second email with a report from Donovan Scruggs. Did everybody get that email? Do I have a motion to accept that to the minutes? Make a motion to accept it. I got a motion, Joe. Second. Second. Kevin, all in favor? Aye. 
all opposed, and I should have just looped this one in, but since I didn't, we'll go again. So we got an email sitting on our desk uh, when we got in here from Ashley. Uh, do I want to do I have a motion to accept this into the minutes? So moved. Uh, motion, Kevin. Second. Uh, Joe, all in favor? Aye. Uh, all right. I think we're good. Wait, that was the only two things, right? That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is a 61-acre uh, uh, piece of property being requested, as you noted, to uh, be rezoned from the R1 single-family district to the R2 uh, low-medium density residential district, which are both single-family districts. The only difference in um, uh, there uh, is a difference in the size of lots that are minimum size of lots that are required. R1 has a 100-foot um, of width and 13,500 square foot area. R2 is 80 feet of width and uh, 11,250 square feet of area. Uh, the uh, just to refresh memory for any kind of rezoning, that the criteria for a zoning change are that one, there was a mistake in the original zoning, or two, the character of the neighborhood has changed to an uh, extent to justify it. Um, in addition, also the applicant is on the the burden is on the applicant. To describe the need in the community for the rezoning. In this case, uh, the staff recommendation is for maintenance of the R1 uh, zoning of the property and uh, denial of the R2 proposed uh, zoning change. Our reasons for that is that the in looking at the subdivisions in the immediate immediate neighborhood, uh, they were developed in a way consistent with the R1 zoning district regulations. They're in effect at that time. Bienville Place is a conventional subdivision, this is its 194 lots, consistent with the R1 district. Now Stillwater Bluff, while it is zoned R1, it is a 14 lot plain unit development um, that the overall density was maintained, well, for the R1 district was maintained, but uh, there were, um, it did allow narrower lots in order to preserve open space. Now, I'll see if you would Scroll down a little bit to show the, um, the uh, Spanish Cove subdivision there, man. Just pull the pull the map down a little bit. Okay, yeah. The, uh, you can see there on the bottom of that of the screen is the R3 zoning district. That was a recent new development in the vicinity. That's the Spanish Cove subdivision that was rezoned to that R3 district. Um, I think uh, four years ago, if I remember, it serves me right, and it is uh, totally built out at the present time. Uh, also, a component of this request is that because of, as you can see, the uh, large part of the of the property is within um, wetlands as part of the uh, I think that's Davis Bayou, so that the conservation subdivision provisions of the UDC uh, possibly could apply to that. That would be done. Uh, as part of the subdivision application, sketch plat application process for subdivision. That uh, conservation subdivision provisions does uh, require a minimum of 40% of the total area be designated as a conservation area. In addition, in return for that, the lots within the conservation subdivision can vary up to 25% of the minimum area, minimum frontage, or minimum width. Uh, for that zoning district. And in page two of the report, it gives you the uh, what that means in practical sense for both the R1 district and the R2 district. That uh, also, uh, the, uh, we did look at the comprehensive plan and how that uh, would, have, would apply to this situation. And uh, the Comprehensive plan does recognize uh, that there is a need for a mix of residential types, uh, but also wants to uh, ensure that land uses of budding them are compatible with the scale, intensity, and overall character of the neighborhood. So in this situation here, I think the the what is the neighborhood is the uh, key to to uh, the change here. Uh, from staff standpoint, we are looking at just the immediate area. Uh, a more narrow focus of neighborhood. Um, I think the applicant, uh, Mr. Scruggs, will uh, want to argue that that is a broader, he needs a broader definition of that. Um, 
and that's up to y'all as planning commission to make a recommendation to the board of aldermen as do you feel that the uh, there has been a change in the neighborhood or the mistake in the zoning and is there a need for this uh, rezoning as i said staff is recommending denial uh maintenance of the r1 district but uh you know, uh, donovan scruggs planner with uh, representing Land, land development is here to make a presentation of it also so uh, I'll, anybody, that's, I'll answer any questions you have but that'll conclude my report anybody have anything for staff before we open to the applicant um what was spanish Cove property zoned before the change in 2018 it, it was zoned r1 oh. yes and, and partially that was done before the udc was in place okay. so there was no conservation subdivision tool at the time okay. so it was the only option to work around the it was the, the defense of it was to work around the wetlands in the way that a subdivision or a conservation overlay would accomplish now plus it since it's about uh, unincorporated jackson county on the south side of the uh, spanish old spanish trail uh, my recollection is that there were subdivisions more comparable to that r3 zoning district within jackson county uh, in their zoning districts anybody else all right, my little uh, spiel with every rezoning. Uh, just remember, we rezone parcels. We re don't rezone properties. So any rezoning will carry in perpetuity, regardless of who, what, where, why. So just keep that in mind. Um, in this case, I don't know. We don't have a map of the proposed property in our back anyway, so it's not as applicable here. But um, all right, Donovan, let's try to keep her under 10 minutes here, and we'll open the floor after that. I'll try my best, uh, Andy. My name is Donovan Scruggs of 317 Pine Drive, and uh, I've been asked to assist uh, Ms. Ritt on the uh, rezoning of this property. Um, as I guess uh, Wade alluded to, he and I may not see exactly eye to eye on uh, some of the comments that were made in the details of his report. The property is 61 acres, 60 acres in size, which does contain a good bit of wetlands. Um, it also is uh, located on the north side of Dex Bayou, which makes the property uh, very attractive, especially along that lake with the uh, numerous waterfront lots. The uh, property itself um, is, um, you know, located there on Hanshaw uh, Road, and it, it, we need to discuss, you know, discuss, you know, what the neighborhood is. Um, uh, the, the narrow focus that well, Wade admitted taking is saying that basically it just is those that are in immediate proximity. However, you know, um, it's hard to discount that just to the north is Blossman Gas, uh, which is not part of his neighborhood. Uh, nor does it include uh, the Circle K or the area that was recently resolved in David Bayou to uh, the CMX2. Of course, Stillwater Bluff, while um, it is enlarged in a size that's consistent with the R1 uh, requirements, it did not meet the requirements of R1 and had to go the route of a PUD to get approved. I mean, it could not get a variance. It had to get rezoned technically to a PUD to be approved. Uh, and they did that, and now the lots uh, with the 75 feet width, in my opinion, does change the character. And of course, if you look to the south, you're also going to see Spanish Cove. Spanish Cove uh, is in the neighborhood. There's no two ways about it. Spanish Cove is part of this neighborhood because when you look at the size of that property, it's actually like saying that uh, a hundred foot property you can say that uh, uh, the next two properties down are in it. It should be proportional. If I've got a piece of property that's basically 1500 feet in size, then you should take that distance out at least and say that's part of my neighborhood. It's when you're dealing uh, primarily in the country and your know, county tracks, you know, area gets a little bit bigger because you do have bigger tracts of land. This is a basically a, a large piece of property, 60 acres, and to say that it can't go 700 feet to the south is a little bit outside of my comfort zone. Now, um, and that property is, of course, zone R3. Now, just like uh, Wade said, with the uh, consideration of what went in with Spanish Cove, this property abuts federal property. It's actually the, the easternmost property in the city that is developable. Uh, everything to the south is privately owned, private, publicly owned. Everything to the north is either uh, already developed or uh, part of the Single River uh, Electric Cooperative. So there is, uh, th this is a fringe property. There is nothing else on the other side of it. Um, as he pointed out in his staff report, um, 
there, this will not lead to other rezonings. There's nothing more to happen here because it is the last piece of property uh, on the east side of Hanshaw. Uh, this is, you know, details of a rezoning that was done not too long ago to CMH2. Now, there is nothing developed there, but the property does show that rezoning has occurred, and the only way a rezoning can occur is if there's a change in neighborhood character. So obviously, just a couple of lots up, there was a change in neighborhood character enough to warrant that rezoning. Um, and you know, this is a change in character. You know, you can look at the property and see, you know, just to the north of, of her site, uh, the, the Circle K gas station, which dumps dumps traffic onto Hanshaw Road. Also, the Lost Peaks and the shopping center there, you know, through the, the uh, shared access with um, uh, with uh, the Circle K, also dumps traffic onto uh, Hanshaw Road. So this is, uh, you know, development within the neighborhood that I think should be noted, and it does create a more intense area uh, surrounding Hanshaw Road. Uh, of course, this is our, our nearest neighbor to the north, which is uh, the uh, substation, the electrical substation, and Blossom and Gas. Blossom and Gas has gotten to a little more retail recently. You can buy accessories for your green eggs and barbecue, and also fill up your propane car with gas as well. Uh, when you look at this particular property here, it kind of shows you a progression of development over the past few years. You know, it shows you back in 1992, uh, this property owner had the luxury of having no neighbors. And now um, they've got a 195 of them away in BMO Place. So when BMO Place went in, it was uh, a definite change in neighborhood character. Um, and that occurred by 2004, all four phases were basically built out. Also by 2004, you can see the emergence of the middle school to the south which um, really is what generates the traffic. The traffic's not really generated by BM Place. It's not going to be generated by 70 lots here uh, on this particular development. The uh, traffic that's being generated is primarily a result of the middle school traffic and everybody from Gulf Park Estates moving themselves uh, you know, out of here and going to work. But you can see in 2019, you've had significant changes because you've had the, the gas station uh, to the north, You've had the development of Stillwater Bluff directly across the street with smaller lots. And you also have the emergence of the um, Spanish Cove to the south. Um, this is market driven when you look at what's being done. And in fact, uh, the Planning Commission and the City Council have done a very good job at recognizing this. In fact, there's only been one development over the past 10 years that has been developed to R1 standard by the book to R1 standards, and that's Maple Woods. That's the only one. Seaside of uh, East Beach, uh, those lots don't meet R1. It has an R1 designation, but it's got lots that are barely over 10,000 square feet in size. So there's been a lot of give, there's been a lot of calling something R1, even though that's not the way it was developed. Just like we call Spanish Cove R1, not Spanish Cove, uh, Stillwater Bluff uh, R1, even though it had to get a PUD to actually be approved that way. If it had to get a PUD to be approved that way, that means it does not comply with the standards. If it does not comply with the standards, it does have an impact or a change in the neighborhood character. Um, and th this is some Im images showing it. Uh, but uh, what I want to say on this is that the, primarily the number of properties that are being developed throughout the city are R3 and RD. They're not R1. They're not even R2. There's only one development that was designed to R2 standards, and that was Case and Cove. So for the most part, this city has gone toward doing everything in an RD or R3 standard, and what we're asking for is a R2. Um, you know, these are examples of the lot sizes that don't leave Meach Code uh, at uh, Stillwater Bluff and also some smaller lots along uh, Seaside. Uh, this is uh, our neighbor to the south, uh, Spanish Cove, that has lot sizes that are in the neighborhood of 8,000 and 7,000 square feet, 7,800 square feet size. Much smaller lots to our south that do impact uh, our neighborhood. This is another shot of Stillwater Bluff, just so you don't forget, 75 feet, does not comply. Now, um, what I did was looked at the developments that are surrounding us. Uh, our particular proposal, uh, 60 acres, 75 lots in that neighborhood, uh, is going to have a density of about 1.25 units per acre. 1.25 units per acre. That's not dense, guys. That's not four, that's not two, that's 1.25 units per acre. Uh, even if we go up to 79, we're going to be at 1.31 units per acre. Bimble Place is developed at 1.77 units per acre. 
a much higher density, still water bluff, 175 per acre, a much higher density than what we're asking for. And then of course, Spanish Coves at 3.1. So, you know, this conservation subdivision that we're going in, it may have smaller lots if we're approved that way, because we have to come before you and before the Board of Aldermen to get that approval. But I mean, it, we're still looking at an overall uh, development plan that's going to be much less dense than our neighbors. And why are we asking going this route? The wetlands that trickle up through this development are, are all over the place. And we need a little bit of give to actually make this happen. Apparently, uh, that was the premise that went with Spanish Cove when it was developed, and we're asking for that same consideration. Not before, well, but we do have a need for it, but like I said, it is based on the change in neighborhood character. But as you can see, with leaving these wetlands intact, definitely make it very hard to develop to um, the standards of R1, which would be 100 foot lots, which would probably cut this down by you know 15 to 20 lots. Uh, and the project would just simply not be feasible. Here's the distances I've looked at. You know, uh, we're, what, 650 feet from, um, uh, can't read, I'm getting old. 350 feet from Blossom and Gas, 650 from uh, the CMX zone, and 700 feet from Spanish Cove. You know, Spanish Cove actually has access directly on to uh, Hanshaw Road by that secondary access road. So it does have access to it, uh, and so it is a neighbor uh, along uh, Hanshaw Road. Um, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the 1,500 feet and the way you need to look at it. You know, if we're 1,500 feet in size, I think you ought to at least consider my neighbor uh, within 1,500 feet of me. Are you about wrapping up, Donovan? I'll do my best. I'm getting very close. This is something I do want to talk about, and I'll do it as fast as I can because y'all just approved it tonight. You actually authorize a change in zoning for the hospital uh, on a lot split, meaning that a, a change in a subdivision actually warranted a um, a reason to rezone. That's a line on a map that really wasn't approved until tonight. So uh, lines on maps matter. So even if we say that Hans uh, Spanish Cove access is on to uh, Old Spanish Trail, the lines on the map, the R3 lines are within 700, 700 feet and therefore should matter for a change in neighborhood character. Uh, a lot of stuff on housing. Look, there's only five houses, about five houses for sale between two hundred fifty and three hundred, uh, five hundred thousand dollars in the city. Very, very limited housing available, and you'll have no lots. There is not a subdivision out there that's ready to develop today. Nobody can build fifty houses next year or the following year unless some subdivisions are approved. Uh, this is from Vizillo and from Realtor.com. So um, I, I do want to mention, and I'll be as fast as I can, because I know the, the people from BMW Place want to know what's going to happen. Uh, what we're talking about doing here is a, houses that are going to be about $365,000 in value. That's the, the price we're look, looking at right now. It's probably going to be valued more by the time they're actually constructed. Um, the, uh, they're going to be predominantly brick. There will be some hardy board on there, but it's not going to be uh, some of the vinyl or some of the ephas that you see in other areas. Uh, I looked at the numbers on Zillow. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it looks like the numbers in BMW Place were like 130, 140, 150 in, uh, in square footage. This is going to be about 170. So we do plan to put out a very, very good product uh, if we're allowed to move forward with this. They will not be the 3,000, 4,000 square foot houses that you have in BMW Place, but they will be quality homes, uh, which is really what people are looking for nowadays. We, to address traffic, our access points are planned to line up with Cabildo Place and with the um, Big Ridge or um, High Ridge Drive, that will give us the opportunity for a four-way stop or a roundabout if uh, the city sees it necessary to do something to alleviate those concerns. So we do want to work with the neighborhood, uh, our neighborhood that's across the street and the ones that's south of us, and hopefully uh, put together a project that would make everybody happy. Tons of reasons for public need. Uh, I've gone through those, but basically what we're asking for is that you uh, just tell Rob and Ricky and the other uh, members of the planning uh, of the Board of Aldermen to uh, to recommend approval or accept the recommendation for approval for this project based on the change in neighborhood character and of the evidence of uh, public need that we've demonstrated in my report and here tonight. And I'm sorry if I'm long-winded, but you know, probably expected that when I got up here. And, and for record's sake, you only say Rob and Ricky because they're in attendance tonight, right? You oh, they're here? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
Anybody have anything before we move to the floor? <clears throat> Donovan, you did pretty well on time. I'll have to give it to you. All right, so again, uh, we will open it up to those who want to speak in favor of it first, and then we will close that down. We're going to limit that to 30 minutes total, three minutes per person, uh, unless somebody wants to concede their time otherwise. And after those in favor, we will then open it to those opposed. We'll then close the public hearing. We'll give the applicant five more minutes just to rebut, not to continue on his presentation, but to speak to any items brought up. And then we will take over from there. Um, does anybody in the audience want to speak in favor of four? Come on, Doug. Name and address the microphone, please. All right. I'm Doug Molino, 2701 English Drive. And I'm a real estate broker on this project, so I've been involved with this property for a long time. And I've looked at a lot of proposals that have come across our, 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 our desk for review from local developers on up to D.R. Horton. And I can honestly say that this plan that, that uh, Brandon Elliott put forward is the best plan I've seen to create the nicest neighborhood for our city. And it preserves the um, wetlands of their natural state, which I think is super critical. The density at kind of 1.25 lots per acre, it's really 63.59 acres. It's actually less density than 1.25. If every lot got the same amount of property, uh, uh, you know, 75 lots and 63.5 acres, every lot would be about 0.85 acres in size. So the density is so low, I think it's a no-brainer to, uh, to, you know, to approve it because it's well under the, the um, density of typical R1, uh, even R2. Uh, the last thing I want to say, I don't want to reiterate anything that, that Donovan has said, but I do echo everything he said with the change in the character of the neighborhood and the public need. But this property is, is is so isolated when you really look at it to the to the east and to the south is 1100 acres of government sandhill crane preserve to the north is the railroad tracks which is a very natural barrier barrier you've got the bayou running on three sides of the property hanshaw running down the west side of the property nobody would have any clue as to how big lots were in there uh, driving down Hanshaw, you'd have to live there to even know about the small variance that they're requesting from R1 to R2. You just want to see it. Lot sizes these days have very little to do with values of properties. Uh, Mulberry Place is a prime example. Those are R2 lots, very small, large houses, most expensive in the area. Uh, so I don't think that the, I feel very strongly that this, this development that he's proposing is going to uh, add to our community uh, and, a, and, a, and a product that we so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to speak in favor? Uh, name and address of the microphone, please. Jason Garner, 2501 Bible Boulevard. Um, I'm just here to, uh, to say that I do think there's a great need for housing in this market. Having a, a, a child that just got to move back home from living out of state, um, we got to looking for, for housing and uh, it was virtually impossible. As Donovan pointed out, there was only five available houses, you know, in a certain price point at, at that time. And I am a real estate professional and I can concur with both Doug and Donovan's you know, statements about the, the lack of, of, of housing. And um, I did have a chance to, to look at this property as well. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Mr. Elliott's plan to develop this property is, is great. He's avoiding the impact of the wetlands. Uh, if, if I would have had an opportunity to try to develop this thing, I would have tried to mitigate wetlands and things like that. And, and frankly, I would have done more harm to the, the area and what's, what's going on than he is because he's trying to avoid the impact of the wetlands. It causes him to have to develop slightly smaller lots. But as Doug mentioned, the lot size doesn't matter anymore. So um, Mr. Elliott builds great houses. I have friends in those houses. They're, they're, they're great uh, additions to the neighborhood, and so I'd be totally in favor of this uh, this development. So, thank you. Anybody else in favor of want to speak? Uh, name and address, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Carolyn Mitrick. My parents bought that property in 1945. Time has gone by. 
Mr. Elliott has done a remarkable job of putting a beautiful, beautiful plan for that property. It's something that I need to do at this time in my life because I'm alone. I don't need 60 plus acres. <laughs> I don't need the huge house that I'm in, but that's not the point. The point is the development project is beautiful and I hope that it is approved and I would recommend it very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Anybody else in favor of? Name and address, please. Yes. Um, I'm Faith Williston, 104 Kirkland Drive, um, and I want to echo everything that's been said so far. Um, I really am excited to see a developer come in and be concerned about the wetlands and our little animals that crawl around that we all love so much. Um, so I would encourage you to reconsider your, your negative um, report to the, to the commission. Um, and I would encourage you to approve the, the rezoning. Okay. Thank you, Faith. Anybody else in favor of? <clears throat> Hi, Brandon Elliott. Uh, I'm the developer. And uh, I just came today to answer any questions. Um, obviously, I'm in favor of, but I wanted to make sure if there was questions of uh, what we're doing out there that I was here to, to answer. Could you address real quick for the one 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 eight East Beach Boulevard, Gulfport, Mississippi. Okay. While Brandon's up, y'all have anything now? And we'll get back in five minutes after too, so we can. Always Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Anybody got anything before he sets? Much twice all. All right. Anybody else in favor of the application? As <laughs> Once, twice sold. All right. We all made your 30 minutes. Let's see. All right. Opposition to 30 minutes, three per person. Um, and feel free to reiterate what the last person said. Uh, do I have anybody in opposition to? All right. I saw yours first. Uh, name and address at the podium, please. I'd like to give you a copy of my paper. Okay. My name is BB Walls, and I <coughs> excuse me, and I represent the Homeowners Association for Bienville Place. Uh, some of the things that um, Mr. Scrugg spoke of, he's already answered that were in my concerns. That, for example, we have a concern about what the value on the homes would be, and he's already addressed that. We're concerned also with the increase in traffic, um, and as he said, a lot of it has to do with the school you know, that drives the traffic down on Hanshaw Road, but still that is a concern for ours. We also have a concern about the access between the two because of the two subdivisions being across from each other. And I believe he addressed that also about trying to line them up so that we can get in and out without so much difficulty. He mentioned something about a traffic, I believe it was referred to as a traffic circle. Um, Perhaps there would be consideration to put up a stoplight or a traffic light and in doing so also make it so that there would be a safety switch so that students crossing the highway could control the traffic for safety reasons. We were concerned about the home sizes and, he's, and the property values and the construction of those homes and he's addressed all of those answers so we have those already. But we're still concerned about the impact on the traffic flow and the size of the lots. I may not have understood his explanation about the 75 properties if it stayed as an R, if it was an R2, it would be 75 lots on 60 acres. But I understand, and if I'm incorrect, please stop me I'm incorrect. But if I understand um, about the conservation subdivision that is addressed in this package though if it's converted to an r2 under the con conservation change those lots would be a width of 60 feet and it would downgrade the size of those lots 
to 8,437 square feet. So they would be significantly smaller lots than what exist in an R1 without a conservation and significantly smaller than what would be across the street from Bienville Place. Am I incorrect about my assumption on the subdivision? Ma'am, let me, let's not talk to the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be happy to I apologize. <laughs> um, I'm going to pause your time real quick and so I don't penalize you. Uh, no, you're, you're not mistaken. Uh, one thing I want to reiterate, and uh, it's kind of applied to some pro comments too, but again, we're not considering the Elliott project and that's like a double fold thing. So uh, we do have, I mean, it, traffic could in increase, right? But today we're, we're changing the color on a map, right? So it, it could be Elliott's project as presented, but it also could be, you know, if that deal fell through, it would still be R2, else. it could be somebody in the future. So I, I do want to mention though, as far as like the traffic concerns, I'm going to call James out because that's my favorite thing to do. James is right behind you. He's a city engineer. As far as traffic, water and sewer, and uh, I thought you had one other, maybe I'm mistaken, but they, the next step, if this was approved and Brandon goes through with it, the next step would be what they would call a sketch plat, and that's kind of like a conceptual layout. That's where we'd actually get the map. That's when James is going to earn his keep by, by looking into traffic impacts, by looking into water <coughs> and sewer impacts, by looking at grading and drainage. So, you know, it's a consideration. I mean, and, you know, we have to consider that as, as kind of just in general but just know that we understand traffic could increase we just don't know james doesn't know nobody here knows how much but right. there's still the sketch plat after that there's still preliminary plat after that there's still final construction review after that and then there's final plat after that so there's still four hurdles that are really going to affect the traffic the water sewer and, and that kind of thing okay. um there's one other thing and I, i'm sorry i'm forgetting but just yeah keep in mind we're not talking about the elliott development we're talking about whether or not this map should be blue or I'm not sure what R2 is, but you know, sure. what the zoning on top of it is. Okay, I'm sorry, keep going. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time on that. We're just concerned about what that development will look like compared to what's across the street with Bienville Place and what impact whoever builds right. that development out, what it will do to our subdivision if it's taken down to an R2, which would decrease the size of the lots as opposed to an R1. Right. And so, but I'm sorry, I didn't say this. The sketch plot would come here. It would be a public hearing, correct? Right. So, I mean, we would, ha we, you, everybody would have a second crack at it, and then the preliminary plot would be a third crack at it. Um, so, just keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing I meant to say is, yes, your math was right. The uh, 8437 conservation subdivision, all that was right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have no further questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lost my train of thought. All right, anybody else want to speak in opposition? I saw this hand right here. Come on up, name and address, please. Thank you, commissioners and staff. I'm Chanel Blum. I live at 4005 Beltair Court, which is in Bienville Place. Um, I, thank you for pointing out that, that this rezoning is not for this project because that was definitely a concern and I know there's been apparently lots of accolades on this project but we don't know that that's what's going to end up there if there was really a need to or if they were going to keep it at 1.25 homes per acre I think was what they said um, why do they need to rezone this you can have one to three homes per acre so um, I realized that the the lot lines may be part of the issue, but um, I'm gonna pause you because that came up twice. So the 1.25 is in total, right? So that does include all the wetland areas that are remaining. Um, so it's not saying that it's you know 1.25 the actual lot. So it's <coughs> overall divided by the number of houses <coughs> would, would be that. So it's they're they're giving a lot more open space than would be required and reducing the lot sizes. Well, I disagree with the brokers that spoke in favor of the size matters. Okay. Um, I, I would also just like to point out, I, I believe that this um, UDC was just done in 2019. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So these, these big changes that everyone's talking about are changes since 2019. This is not something that was done 10 or 20 years ago. What has changed since 2019? 
Do we need homes? If we need homes, it's R1, go build homes. Just build them in accordance with an R1. There was an argument by Mr. Scruggs that, well, none of these other subdivisions that you've approved except for one are true R1 zones. Well, what's the point of having R1 zoning if you're not going to make anybody comply with it? And we would ask my husband, and my husband is here, Mike Blum, and he yielded his three minutes to me also. <laughs> That's yeah, true, absolutely. Mike. <laughs> I have a Mike Blum at the same address, and he said he can he can see it. He signed it. All right, keep going, Mr. Right. Blum. Thank you very much. Uh, the wetlands, yes, that's going to be a, a problem for any developer, but that is not a change in circumstances. They've been there. Uh, this is a really heavy burden that that is required, as y'all know, um, to rezone property. Mississippi law requires, not recommends, but requires, there must be an error in the initial zoning or a change in the character of the neighborhood to such an extent as to justify this reclassification. I don't know what has been so drastically changed in two years, um, but I also don't think that there was an error in your zoning just two years ago, although this property has been um, apparently under R1 requirements before that, as I understand it. As far as the adverse impacts, traffic will be impacted. It is just a matter of how much. Um, I did pull some MDOT, and if I can put one in the record, please. MDOT traffic counts. I couldn't get the whole thing, if y'all could. I've got a couple, if I may approach. Um, Hanshaw Road. The traffic counts per MDOT are at 10,000 cars a day. If you'll look, that's the most of any road in Ocean Springs, any, except for Highway 90. The highest traffic as it is. Is it in part because of the school? Yes. Is it in part because there has been development on Highway 90, such as the Shell Station and the um, shopping center there, which admittedly by Mr. Donovan pours traffic, dumps traffic, I think was the word. On to Hanshaw, yes, traffic is increasing there. It's going to increase more with an R1 subdivision. It doesn't need to increase by an R2. And I just ran some figures and I realized this doesn't take into account streets and open space and all. But if you just take the 63 acres, what they would be allowed, with three per acre in R1, 189 homes, in an R2, 252. So we're looking at an additional 63 homes there. I think 189 or whatever they can fit in there um, is probably going to be sufficient to satisfy any need in housing and eliminate the traffic problems. There was a suggestion about a light. Well, where's the light going to go? If they line up with Cabildo, two houses down is my outlet on the Hanshaw, which is Bergerac. How are you? How is that going to be handled? Traffic getting out in the mornings is a nightmare. In the evenings, it's a nightmare. They've, they've already moved the school zone, and cars still speed through it. They don't, they don't care. Um, maybe that's a way that the city could make some money to have some more enforcement right there. But, but it's a problem, and it's a problem that's documented in that MDOT report that you have. Uh, I've been asked by a neighbor that works at the schools to point out that our schools are overcrowded. I don't have any independent data on that, but I promised her I'd say that. Um, of course, we're worried about property values because we don't know. That may be a great development. Their property values may be more than ours, but we have no idea right now that that's what is going in there. Um, Drainage has become an issue over the last few years. It never was. I've lived there since 2000. It's never been an issue until the last couple of years. I don't know what, what effect that will have, but I'm sure it will have some effect anyway. Um, so you got about one minute okay. left on okay. Mike's time. I'll yield my three okay. minutes to her. All right. Yeah, uh, I need your name and address real quick. Russian. Dan Day, 4002 <laughs> Beltair. Did you get that, Amanda? No. Yes? No. What's the name again? Dan Day, D-A-Y. Thank you. Thank you. Now you got four minutes. Okay. Well, I can slow down a little bit maybe. I've been trying to rush through it. Uh, still water has been discussed. 
is a very nice subdivision, probably nicer than our subdivision, uh, but still the density is not the same as in R2. I think y'all said that even though it's a PED, it's still, the lot lines are changed, but the density is not. Um, still there's more traffic coming out of there though. Um, Spanish Cove rezoned to R3. I don't consider them my direct neighbors. These, this lot is my direct neighbor. Uh, so I don't think that, I, I wouldn't consider that as far as a change in uh, characteristics of the neighborhood. But in any event, we're talking about 2009 again, not, not way back. Um, I would just, I know y'all have a copy of the sounding map, but it's, there's a lot of R1 there and, and we would just ask that at least my husband and Dan Day and I would, would ask that you keep that um, sounding as R1. All right, anybody else in opposition to, all right. Red shirt. Uh, name and address of the microphone, please. Chris Kennedy, 201 Bluff Cove. Um, we got Stillwater Pre uh, HOA, Stillwater Bluff HOA president. And talking about Stillwater, our lots in there, although they are smaller, they're still 15,000 square feet. And one of the concerns, that I've got several people from the neighborhood here, we're all opposed to it, and I think the consensus of our neighborhood is to stay at R1. Um, and one of the things that, you know, the fine print, whether whoever develops it, develops the property, even if it's an R1, you can still take it down, I think, to 10,125 feet per lot on the, the wetlands. Yeah, that's, right? that's correct. That's right. Yeah. So R2 takes it down, what, 2,000 feet more. So uh, if you got down to 8,000 feet, you could almost put two homes on the, the, the lot size I have right now. Um, and I do... To me, the bayou is a natural barrier. I don't consider um, Spanish Cove part of our area. And the same with the railroad tracks. To me, that's all commercial out there. You've got some old homes, but most of that is becoming commercial. You've got the, uh, all the development out on 90. Nobody's gonna put a house up there. Um, and also with the value, like she said earlier, um, I've got a lot invested in it. And you know, maybe it'll be good, I don't know. I'd like to keep it at a, R1 people in Ocean Springs that come here, they do, they are willing to pay more. I mean, you can see that everywhere around here. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, anybody else in opposition to? I can go, but uh, I'm not as well versed as everybody else. I'm just a plain teacher. Um, uh, but I live at 3712 Cabilda Place, Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Yeah. My name is Valvina Caldwell. Okay. Um, a lot of people have talked about rezoning and all that. Having more houses as a teacher, it will impact the school system, okay? Also, I have lived in that neighborhood since 1996. I can tell you the traffic nowadays, even in our neighborhood, is horrible. Hunter Rev has become very dangerous. I have a 13-year-old that prefers to walk every day but to cross that road today, he had to call me because people would not stop. The life would not go on. So he couldn't cross the street. It's like, mom, call me, come pick me up so you can cross the street for me. I was like, no, I just take you to school. Because <laughs> I will be late at school, but you will be safe. But it's ridiculous at this point to me. At four o'clock when he, he gets out of school, he crosses that road and he's like, mom, these people don't stop. People can't let us cross. And it's a group of them. It's not just my kid that walks around. So it's not just rezoning an area, having more houses. It's the impact that it makes and the danger that it, it, our kids see every day or have to go through it every day. The light today wasn't working for the spill light. I mean, I know this is totally different, but the more houses you have, the more people you will have, the more resources they will need. So I believe that you need not to rezone this. That's why I'm in opposition to that. And also, you need more security insurance for my kids to run the street. <laughs> but anyway. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Caldwell. You're welcome. Um, anybody else want to speak in opposition to? All right. Well, 
Name and address of the microphone, please. James Grace, 3718 Bergerac. Got to be a place. I'll make it short. I agree with everything everybody's just said now. I'm opposed to it, mainly because of traffic. You, you know, think about it. Once you turn south on uh, Henshaw, you can't make a left until you get to the middle school. <clears throat> but as soon as you get one person making a left there, traffic's going to back all the way back up. I know this is not about traffic, but I, I see that happening. It's like everybody said, it's bad enough already. So think about that traffic guy when you start planning that. Maybe put an access in from Highway 90, buy a lot there, and put a new river across. Maybe that'll do it. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in opposition to? Name and address at the microphone. <laughs> Hi. Huh? <laughs> okay. Hi, my name's Craig Joe Ackham. I live at 203 Bluff Cove. I do live in Stillwater. Uh, I'm also a former member of the Planning Commission simple sweet you put your faith in these people they've made a recommendation do it okay um anybody else in opposition to opposed to does not want to see it rezoned okay. uh, name and address at the microphone please 3718 we want to say it everybody <laughs> 3718 Berger Ashman, Martha Grace. Now you do agree with everybody, everybody has say, I do oppose to the rezoning, and I think that will affect our neighborhood in this place. You know what I'm And I do take the recommendation. All right, thank you, Ms. Grace. All right, anybody else opposed to opposition? Anybody? Once? Twice sold. Do I have a motion to go out of public hearing? Don't get five minutes. After we get out of public hearing. So, uh, all right. Motion by Matthew. Second, second. by second. Joe. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We are uh, we are opposed. <laughs> we are out of public hearing. Um, and yes, we will give the applicant five minutes to read just to address the concerns and items addressed by the opposition or the proponents, if you'd like. Uh, Mark, we're all uh, spot off. It would be a comment that I have some disagreement with. <laughs> um, Anonymous Trust, we're going to drive here at Ocean Springs. Um, I believe somebody said there has been no change in circumstances or wetlands. Uh, anybody that has anything to do with wetland or developments uh, knows that that's just not the case. The way you developed the 1990s was simply go out and mitigate wetlands, and you did that in a fairly quick process. Uh, today, uh, I don't even know if the Army Corps is still working. I think they're still on the COVID break. Uh, and then the opportunity to actually mitigate wetlands is more along a 18 month process to do anything of this size. It is not like it was in the 1990s. Uh, <coughs> therefore, uh, BMW Place basically developed uh, on 100% of its property. That's why you have the 1.75%, the 1.75 units per acre, because they actually utilized every bit of their property and was able to mitigate the wetlands. We're not doing it that way. We're going to actually leave the wetlands intact, uh, leave them alone, and therefore we're going to be much, much lower in uh, density. And by doing that, yes, it does require some reconfiguring of lot sizes to make those smaller. Uh, I know there's a bunch of folks from uh, Stillwater Bluff here in opposition of it. I don't know if they were here the last time a, pr a project came before uh, this body for Hanshaw Road, which was Stillwater Bluff. And it, I think Marshall was here. I don't think anybody else was. BMW Place came out in strong opposition against that development as well. Said the same things that's going to happen, you know, with the Stillwater Bluffs, more traffic, smaller lots. We don't know the value. Please vote it down. And Stillwater Bluff turned out to be a great project. It's a great, great neighborhood. So, um, you know, yeah, there's a fear of the unknown, but everybody knows that people want to live in Ocean Springs. We're not going to do a, um, project that is less than superior because that's what's expected here in the city. So I do think that we're going to uh, you know, make everybody happy with their proposal. We are talking about a zoning change here. The zoning change we're asking for is to R2, 11,250. If we're able to come in and ask you guys for a conservation subdivision, and if you give it to us, it's going to be based on the plan we provide. 
If we come in and say we're going to build a bunch of 8,200 square foot lots and we're going to smack them in there as tightly as we can, and it's going to, we don't care what it looks like because we're going for density. If you guys approve it, you need to lose your jobs because that's not what we're going to do. I mean, we're going to provide you something that can sell and something that the people in Ocean Springs want to see. So, no, we have just not this buy right opportunity to come in and say we want to do 8,200 square foot lots because now we have a uh, R2 zoning. That's just not the case. Um, the traffic impacts for uh, R1 to an R2 uh, with 10,000 cars today won't even be noticed. A subdivision will. I'm not going to say that you know 65, 75 units aren't going to be noticed, but the minimal difference between 65 units and 75 units or 58 units and 68 units is going to be very, very minimal. So keeping this as R1 basically going to kill the project um, and you won't get a guy who's coming in saying, I'm going to save the wetlands and I'm going to try to do this as, as, as nicely as possible. Brandon Elliott builds good homes. Uh, there are developers out there that don't build good homes. So I do think that this project is something that would uh, enhance Hanshaw Road. It will enhance Ocean Springs and it will enhance the neighborhood that extends all the way from Highway 90 to uh, Spanish Cove. So um, that's my points. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you got. I do want to point out that I gave you a book to read. Uh, uh, I want to believe that if Wade had the opportunity to read that book, his uh, recommendation would have been a little more positive and a lot further away from the denial. I'm not saying he would. He may not have liked it anyway. I mean, it may have put him to sleep. But I do know that it was put in, turned in late last week. He did not have the opportunity to review it, and therefore it's not part of his um, review process. So, uh, Craig, he may have actually been able to uh, give me a positive recommendation had he had the opportunity to look at that. It's not fault, not blaming away for it, but it is a fact that I do want to point out. Okay. While he's up here, has anybody got any questions, comments, concerns for him or Brandon for that matter? Okay. Thank you, Donovan. Thank you. All right, guys, let's hear some discussion. A lot of notes there. I, mean, I think uh, I mean, whatever development does end up here is going to be a conservation development, which is going to reduce those lot sizes even farther, or the allowance of those lot sizes even farther. But that's not what we're looking at. Yeah, I, mean, I would say you can't really. I don't think we can factor well, that in. I think, I think that your point. I think is, the wetlands does factor into what this parcel is zoned. Would you say your point is not that it will, but that it could, correct? Right? Right. That if we did rezone it to R2, they could use the CS. To get but, down to 60 feet of turnage on a lot. But the cost of that is a 40% turnover of land, or not turnover, but conservation. Yeah. yeah. We don't even know the amount of wetlands on the property. I mean, we're looking at what's in the flood zone. It's not necessarily what's wetlands. Say that again. I mean that's the floodway, right? It's not the it's not the wetlands necessarily. Yeah, the so orange think, on that map would be I assume way that's the hundred year floodplain on the orange. Correct? That's correct. That's the orange is the uh, AE zone, the one hundred year floodplain. But you can build in that. Right. Does anybody here think this was a mistake to zone it R one in the first place? I don't. I don't. I don't think we're. I don't think anybody's arguing for a. It was a mistake. Right. So we can take that one off the table. Yep. I think our charge is what is the neighborhood and, and has that neighborhood changed significantly enough to justify, has the character of that neighborhood changed to justify a reason? My understanding, Wade, Carolyn, correct me if y'all know differently, there is no definitions of neighborhood. It's kind of at the city's discretion. I mean, obviously there's some, yeah, we can't say downtown, just installed a new It's building. case by case. That's right. what, what you feel like it's, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, what you consider to be the neighborhood and um when was still water built in it was uh was it 2014 yeah so before the adoption of the units correct well it was it it was done as a pud at that time the planning and development regulations were still in effect right one thing i want to mention and carolyn please correct me if i'm wrong but um r1 and r2 they came in basically verbatim correct you mean into the I'm UDC? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. From the old code to the new code? Correct. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I think that changed with R2 was setbacks, but size dimensions. Size and dimensions were the same. Were the same. Yeah, and I, I can't even remember if the setback changed. I, I think the 
they were brought over from the previous regulations just as, as they right. were. Because well, I know we, I remember we had them slated to change, and that was one of the changes yeah. we changed. That's they did correct. not change. Yeah. We changes we unchanged? Okay. Yes. So I don't, I don't know that we can just completely draw a line down a sheet of paper at 2019 to, your, to that point, Kevin, as far as, you know, I don't, I don't think the rules change significantly to say that the EDC either negatively or positively change the character of the neighborhood in this situation. Right. I'm, I'm just thinking if we're saying the neighborhood has changed, the only thing that has changed is Spanish code. That's really the only change. The amount of traffic on the inch I mean, I think there's other things you can take into account. I don't, yeah, I wouldn't agree that the only thing that changed um, is what's happening in the entire, that area, I mean, where you want to limit it. Well, there's no time stipulation that I'm aware of, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never heard of a time stipulation. I would actually think that a neighborhood would, would change. it should gradually, like it shouldn't sharply change, right? So I think a change in character should, I mean, I would say still water. I mean, whether or not it changed the neighborhood to R2, it was a change of character in the neighborhood. Now, whether or not it's enough to justify, that's, that's our question here. But I would think that, you know, anything you consider in the neighborhood within the last 20 plus years should be eligible or considerable. I mean, I think there's a change in the neighborhood based on what's going on even outside of the city that's causing the traffic to increase on hand I mean, if you're looking at all the development in Jackson County that is going, that's using Ocean Springs Middle. And Alan, going, Alan, can you play your mic? Oh, that's going through, you know, going to school at Ocean Springs. Uh, and being there in Don't be afraid of the microphone. South Jackson County with Can I have a man to pull that up on the big screen? Can you get the zoning map up? There is a city portal. Did just freeze Um if your argument is that Hanshaw Road in and of itself is part of the neighborhood, I would agree with it. I don't think we would consider something, you know, the actual development of it as a, you know, if you're, well, if you're trying to link the, the impacts of yeah, Hanshaw change. Road, then that could be considered. I think a lot of the issues yeah. are brought up, you know, are more about that than they are about the developments that have occurred yeah. around the road. While he's doing this, I want to clarify one one statement I made earlier that may have sounded weird. Um, the traffic impacts, the reason I don't think we can consider it now is, to Donovan's point, it is about maybe not quite 18 months, but it, something this big could be an 18-month wetland deal, but somebody could effectively, probably not, but could build the entirety of those 60 lots in an R1 fashion and get double the 75 lots they're proposing. So the traffic really can't be considered till later as far as what those actual impacts are. Um, go ahead. What was your point, Matt? I mean, my point is looking at it is the really only R2 that is existing in the city right now is down, you know, in Bechtel and uh, Fort Bayou Estates, a little bit on Riley Road, and then you go back on CC Road, and that's pretty much it on the R2. Um, pretty much everything adjacent to the proposed property is R1. I mean, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing a big character change right now to justify it on my part. Thoughts? You don't consider Spanish Cove then part of that? Spanish Cove was a little bit of a different um, how the property was set up in itself, and we didn't have the, we didn't deal with the wetlands. We didn't have the conservation sub um, overlay option at that time. But can we, can we, but are we taking that into account right now? That we have that, and that was to prevent future zoning changes. Well, the 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 conservation overlay really kind of took the place of what the PUD had been intended to do, which is provide flexible configuration and lot sizes if you are preserving wetlands and staying away from them. That was kind of the intention. So when the PUD was was dissolved. Um, and we were doing the UDC, this was kind of what took its place to accomplish that and allow for smaller lots in exchange for staying, you know, giving the conservation subdivision 
but without increasing density, just allow for the flexibility of lot sizes. Um, and that's what um, Phil Water did not have that option. They had the PUD, and Spanish Cove didn't have either. So just to keep that into perspective when you're using these terms and what, what they had accomplished or were mean, meant to accomplish. And I guess at yeah. that point, we are supposed to take it into account then. Well, any property is eligible for a conservation overlay. I mean, if they meet the criteria. So it's, it's not just for this property or it's just, it's a tool that's in the toolbox for a property that has a substantial amount of wet areas or official wetlands um, so that they can, <coughs> with the same amount of density, still provide those smaller lots in exchange for staying away from the sensitive uh, pristine wetlands area. So that is an option to them regardless of zoning. Right. You know. Yeah, and I guess I'm having trouble kind of putting those things together because if you're looking at it from what we're looking at right now, we're not technically aware of the plat. We're not aware of the amount of wetlands. We're not That's aware correct. of correct. anything, mm -hmm. but we're trying to take that into account. Of what could happen. That right. could happen. So what am I supposed to use as those well, I, I think it's like Wade said earlier, and Andy may have hit on it, when you rezone the property, it permanently changes the what you can and cannot do on the property, regardless of who, of who owns it. So that's what you all are supposed to take into account, is what could happen. Um, but not, so not inferring what's, what the property actually is, what the amount of weapons are. Right, and you don't have that information. But the conservation subdivision is also aimed at, I mean, I don't know that these words are in it, but it's basically no net increase in density. I don't know that that's required, but you say, hey, you get a little bit smaller lots, but you got to give up 40%, and that's substantial, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this would be a means to get a little bit more density in there. Um, now, from what area? concentration, or just in general? The well, rezoning I mean, would allow yeah, higher rezoning. density. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't matter about the conservation, because the conservation should not affect density. Now, I'm not doing the math to tell you that it's down to the single lot for it, but in theory, the conservation subdivision doesn't allow more density, so it doesn't matter. It's either R1 with or without, or R2 with or without. Either way, R2 will allow it, and again, it's the property. I mean, somebody, this is, I'm going to be a little bit facetious here, but we could rezone this to R2, and then, uh, you know, Brandon could just go build his one house on there. You know, maybe he wants 60 acres to live on in the middle of Ocean Springs for some reason, and that would be allowed. Um, or somebody could come in and demo every last bit of wetlands and, you know, put um, 200, what is Janelle, was that you, 200 something, which again, that's not going to happen either. So it's going to be somewhere in the middle of one house and 200 and however many. Y'all got anything down on that end of the table? <laughs> come on, Marshall, I know you got something to say. Nah. I'll pass on it. I was musing on something that uh, I know we can't take conservation because we don't know what's going to happen to it. But if you started with R1 and applied conservation, you kind of got an R2 out of that, like a pocket R2. Mm -hmm. As far as size of lots, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, which is, I guess, the intent of it. But it's hard to take that into account if we're not taking that into account at this stage, too. But again, the conservation is at the, the just, you know, our discretion ultimately but at the discretion of the developer to use and we just I mean really can't you know we had one time and we didn't even make the reversion clause we don't do reversion clauses on zoning I don't even think that's legal no, it's, it's no. discouraged yeah. at the very least yeah um, right like we have promises or not promises but things said about 1.25 per acre and things right. like that it doesn't really matter yeah, yeah. it's all moved Right. Even conditional zoning is not something that we, we just, it's, I mean, the short of it is we can't consider the project. We have to consider the property. Is the neighborhood changed? And, you know, the character of the neighborhood changed over the last 5, 10, 15, 20, 150 years. And uh, to just uh, to justify it. Personally, I'm not going to argue public need. I, I think public need is there. So public need, Wade, correct me if I'm wrong, but state ball, public need has to exist in tandem with the change of character. Correct? Exactly. Okay. That's correct. Um, but I, I, I don't, does anybody disagree that there's not a public need for housing in Ocean Springs? I guess you could disagree that you need R2 housing. No, we got two projects in the works already. The last two, over on Riley Road. There we go. They haven't started yet, but they're here. Well, I mean, the, the question, I mean, it's all about time, and I don't 
know anymore how, how close those are, but those are probably pretty close to being built out. This one's probably, I would guess, if they break ground in a year, I'd be surprised just with the current building. Yeah, I mean, you know, sure, but your pool is different on apartment complexes than homes, too. Like, you know, I don't know. There's living space. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a public need. You don't, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Joe said, "Call the boat. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody want to take a stab at a motion?" your motion and, and look at the attorney is it better to have a, a specific reason stated in the motion or is that I think you can do exactly how you okay. consider it all right Joe uh, has a motion to recommend denial do I have a second for a denial that motion is that Marshall all right I have a motion on the floor for denial all in favor aye, aye. aye. all opposed so you voted yes yeah. Yeah. All right, so that would go denied, uh, unanimous. Uh, just to remind, let me ask Carolyn, is this, this is going to wait, correct? This will be advertised for a second public hearing at the first meeting in December for the board. All right, so everybody needs to know that. What was it? What was the date? Uh, the first Tuesday. December 7th. December 7th. All right, so there will be a second public hearing on this particular project uh, on December 7th at the board of all the new meeting same bat time same bat places we're at now tuesday night december 7th and it will be advertised again so any input can be emailed uh yeah. ahead of time will appear and be presented to the board along with the input that was received here today yeah so everything uh actually one more little piece of housekeeping we did receive two handouts one was bienville place uh letter we'll call it and the second was the traffic count uh, that was all that was handed out, correct? You had the one, yeah. you had the other. All right, do I have a motion to accept those into the minutes? And can you end my PowerPoint? Can I end the uh, PowerPoint as well? So moved on. Second. Uh, motion to accept all three into the minutes. Uh, motion Matthew, second Kevin. All in favor? Aye. All right. All opposed? Uh, thank you, Donovan. I would have definitely glazed over that. Um, if y'all didn't hear Carolyn, you are allowed to and encouraged to send in your letters, thoughts, even you can send them to email. Do you want those to you? Yeah, the email, there's a planning admin, um, the, the email address that was in the uh, public notice, planning admin at oceansprings-ms.gov. That's just the best the best way to go ahead and have it, and then we have it in writing, and we'll incorporate it in the packet that goes to the board. Okay, so it will be advertised again. Y'all will get a second chance. Both the, those in favor and in the opposition, please comment, show up. And uh, twelve seven. Okay. Um, item four E is going to be another public hearing. This is, let's give a minute for everybody to step out, huh? Take a breather. <laughs> Four E is going to be a public hearing. This is going to be an amendment to the code of ordinances for the city of Ocean Springs, amending Appendix D, Article Five, Section Five Ten, Item B Ten. This is related to short-term rentals. Do I have a motion to go into public hearing? So moved. Uh, ooh, that's that's interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna give Marshall the motion and uh, Joe the second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Sorry, Matthew, your name's not going to be on the record. No, that's fine. If I just said it, it's on the record. All right, so this is going to be Wade or Carolyn? I got this one. Carolyn. I'm done. It's fun stuff, huh? I'm done for the evening. Thank you. <laughs> you going home? <laughs> no, he's not going home. Um, uh, this was discussed actually at either the last meeting, I believe, um, and we, I did talk to the board as far as getting their direction to bring this to you. So what you have in front of you is a draft to, to change in the ordinance in the section that uh, Andy so, so eloquently um, read to you. Uh, to increase the cap. Right now we have a cap of 50 residentially zoned short-term rentals. No, this does not include the commercially zoned properties um, of 50. And the proposal based on discussions between both this commission and with the board, uh, we're proposing 75 uh, as the new cap. Like I said, right now we have met the cap of 50. We do have 50 active permits. There are up to 11 uh, applications now on the waiting list in various phases of and stages of review so um, there like said, there is a waiting list and, and a demand for those uh, short-term rental permits so it doesn't change anything else about the regs and requirements and process it just would increase the cap citywide for residential short-term rentals only and I've kind of got that information uh, in for you one of the pieces of the conversation had been complaints regarding short-term rentals and we did confirm that there have been zero complaints registered either through the police department or building um, code enforcement directly related to the use of the property as a short-term rental. Any of the complaints or uh, calls that were made either from or about the property were medical calls, usually from mostly from uh, one particular property and the property owner when there was a, an aging uh, family member and people calling about noise or other things emanating from outside the short-term rentals. So uh, we did confirm that there were no complaints on the properties that have been permitted to date. And outside, not like they're hanging out on the front porch. And, right, right, no, is you know, if not there was- related to- Right, the, a homeless parking person walking down the street and the call came from or, re or referenced this address. So, but there was no direct link between uh, the person who was occupying the property as a short-term renter uh, for any of the active permits uh, in in the and that's for the entire three plus years that we've been doing short-term rentals uh, looking all the way back so just to kind of share that with you so that's what's in front of you is to um, the proposal as discussed to raise the cap to 75 or if there's a number num another number that you all wanted to propose um, but that was kind of the consensus that I received from you all at the last discussion okay. Uh, anything before we have in the public? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. This is a probably typo, but on the probably. considerations, third orders, second line, it's got Sean, it's 835, parentheses 50. Yeah, that's what happens when you use an old memo. Um, it had been 35 originally, and it was raised to 50. So when it was when the short term rental ordinance was originally so be created, so actually yeah, it should be. Right now it says 50. Yeah. Yeah. The current number is 50. The current number is 50. I just used a, use the verbiage from an old memo. Thank you, thank you for approving that. Do you have any other things before? I mean, we're in a public hearing, I'll call it. Did the Board of Aldermen just make a recommendation? They basically directed me to go ahead and work on this, you know, to, to start the process. I just wanted to get there their input prior to it wasn't like a formal direct just during a meeting we just kind of discussed it with the mayor and, and the alderman and was directed to go ahead and as staff to bring this to you my question <coughs> is the first 35 started mm -hmm. 2015 and up right. when was the date that we moved it from 35 to 50. December 2018. yeah 2018 yeah so we reached well, we had we we were at 30. We were very close. close. We, we were, were like it, we five were away. And, and that number fluctuates. The number fluctuates because people don't renew and then a permit becomes available. So actually 60 properties have been permitted over that time period, but 10 just did not renew and opened up a spot. So we've effectively only seen an increase of 15 over two year period. Correct. All right, well, we are in a public hearing. Anybody got anything else before we... I'm just, I'm not going to do for or against because I don't really know what that means in this situation. But if anybody wants to speak about raising the cap <coughs> on short-term rentals, please do so now. I, 
I can point and ask everybody. Anybody on short-term rentals once, twice? Sold. Okay. Do I have a motion? Public here? I don't even have to ask. Kevin, motion to get out. Alan seconds to get out. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We are not in a public hearing. Um, does anybody want to take a stab at a motion or have any other comments to consider? I, I'll just go back to kind of some things I've talked about before. Is I just think there should be something besides just permitting and leaving them if they're active. You know, if we have some way to, if we're going to cap and we're just going to keep expanding it, if we're managing the ones that are actually being, how many are permitted that people aren't using? And are we allowing them to just keep them year over year? And is that occupying spot? Well, we don't really, I mean, we can check their, um, their calendar to see if it's blocked out, but that doesn't necessarily, a lot of people will block out time for their own personal use of their property. Um, we really don't monitor how, you know, that how often it's being used and what the demand is for it. Mm -hmm. um, that would really be, uh, I don't know that we have that information available without some sort of legal action. I'm not really sure. Now, if there is a problem, we can always ask for their guest list. That's in the ordinance. But that's usually if there is a problem and they need to find out who was staying there at any particular time. What's so, the fee? Is there, there's a, a fee to have it reinspected and everything every year? It's, but it's $50, Fifty dollars, and they have yeah. the occupancy, and then twenty-five for processing. So you could hold a permit at the cost of only fifty dollars a year. Yeah, and and some people do, and some people may only rent it during festivals, and that's fine. But they do still renew every year. They renew as long as they renew every year. Um, I, we really don't monitor the you know the success of it. I guess you would say, um, but that's why I think some people at the beginning thought they were going to rent it more or that it was going to be easier than it was and they just decided not to do it anymore. Sometimes the properties changed hands, um, but uh, you know, people found that it wasn't just a, a an easy buck, that there was work that had to be put into it and they just decided not to. Now was your comments in relation to you are against raising it or against just having a cap at all? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of against having a cap. I just think there's got to be a different way to manage it. If we're just looking at it as we're just going to keep bumping it up every time, like either defining where it can be or defining how many we're going to be active at any one time that's kind of a more finite number. Rather well, than I think it's just, you know, it's moderation. It's, you know, modest increases over time. And then if it does become a problem, you know where to stop and then maybe ratchet it back down. Instead of just opening it up and saying, hey, anybody can do it, that's a good point. From a staff, from a staff yeah. perspective, we um, appreciate having the cap. It helps does help us to manage it when, when Amanda's talking to people when they call. It, it kind of lets them know that it, it's not something that we are just going to give to everybody. A, you have to go through a, a process that's not an easy process, and B, they're in demand. Um, and it does allow us to report on it to say you have so many available, and it allows the board to kind of look at it from time to time to see the success of it or, or whatnot. So uh, yeah, we appreciate having a cap. And yeah. my, my yeah. only thought on that was like allowing anyone to do it, but making it almost more stringent or more difficult for them to do it. But that's kind of a burden on us. It's pretty it's pretty difficult right now. Well. Yeah. Some people, that's why some people sit in the queue for years. We've had some people on the waiting list for years because they just, they thought about it and then it's just too much work and they haven't done it. Right. So we have their application, but they've made no action on it in years. So. It, some of them hang around for a while before they actually go forward or withdraw. All right, well, we have in front of us a recommendation for 75 to Carolyn's point. We could make that 76, we could make that 100, we could make that 51, or we could say we don't want to increase it at all. Um, me yep. personally, I, I'm fine with 75. Uh, probably the dumbest thing I'll say tonight, which is saying a lot, but. I like the idea of a cap, and I can't even tell you why. I just kind of like it. It just makes me feel good to have a number there. But um, I see your point about if you're going to arbitrarily raise it every time, but at the same time, I was surprised that there's just been zero in, in six years uh, complaints related directly to it. It just seems by a law of averages there would have been one. Right. Well, especially because um, we hear complaints on the front end, but not really. That's right. A, lo a lot of it is perceived perceived issues. And and, and I think because the, the the process is, you know, difficult. In fact, other cities have taken our ordinance and kind of looked at the process. If you're going to run the business correctly to where you're not a negative impact on the neighborhood, it's not a problem. You're going to do these things anyway. So, yeah, we and at least I can say that, you know, if people have not been happy with it, they haven't called and made an official complaint, which is our only metric. I think so, a lot of people find out that property managers want <coughs> 25 to 35 percent. 
on short term rental. Right, maybe that's why and some people don't don't renew. Yeah. Money and, and that's kind of a self regulatory business. If you don't do a good right. job, if you don't get good reviews, you are done. You are done. You're done. Yes. You ready for a motion? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. The motion we recommend modification of section 510b10 of the uh, current short term rental ordinance to increase the citywide cap for residential zone short term rental permits to 75. Second, okay. Motion Marshall, second Kevin to do the 75 as presented. All in favor, aye. All opposed. And this will also be advertised for another public for hearing. The, for the December well, did I not put another motion on the table? What do you, yeah, I mean, wait, well, no, I just, you know, y'all kind of jibber jabber down there, but kind of doing the numbers on it and everything, the logistics by it, I mean, we're only moving it up another 50, okay, to 75, 25, 25 okay, but over that period of looking at it and everything, we're going to have to readdress this short time down the road. I'm thinking realistically, you know, the ebb and flow, we've had 10 people not renew, and we've had four denials on it and everything. I, I'm more in favor of the 100, you know. So we have a motion, so I mean, you, you would have to do a new motion, and we could do that if somebody supports it in seconds and votes and I'm go for just, it. Go it out there. Let's see what happens. Let's have fun with it. Well, you'd have to rescind this first. One that you made, and then well, we've already well, made the motion and approved. Yeah, uh, we well, no, I just I would like to hear you know mm -hmm. rebuttal against of. I kind of like the twenty five. If we have to come back in six months or a year and revisit it again, I'm okay well, with that. I think keeping it at twenty five that way. If we have to come back in six months, then we know, hey, this is probably yeah. We get seventy five, and it's quick. still not a problem. Or we get seventy five, and oh my goodness, now we got a problem. Or it's two, three years from now, and it's like okay, that's probably the right amount to move it up. So like I'm a statistics guy, so before we actually went from 35 to 15, which was, was less. Was 11 on the waiting list, so we shot, so we're really only going up. But that was less than a 50% increase. Today, we're, you know, proportionally, we're making it even more than the first time. We I'm looking it. at more of like the 15 bump, but that are, is that right? Yeah, 14 over two years. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm thinking those 14, and we can kind of play that versus what it was the first time, and that gives us a good idea of how quickly it's escalating. And we really don't know the factors that made it escalate. A lot of it was, um, I, I, I honestly feel that, you know, some of the, the, the COVID and other things made a difference. I think people realized they didn't want to stay in hotels and they'd rather stay in short-term rentals. That could have played an effect. Uh, we, we don't know what caused it to increase and we still don't know really what's going to cause it to increase if it does again or decrease. Um, so it, it's not an, an issue for us if you wanted to do it 75 and then come back in a year. Uh, we really don't know how it's going to how it's going to impact. If an increase is going to impact the, the level of interest, or if some of the ones that are already permitted have lost interest and and don't renew, we have no idea of, of right. predicting that. Ocean Springs phenomenon, so yeah. Right. I mean, so my my 100 versus 75 argument in favor of 75, Matthew, would just be that it gives us another stepping stone to decide like somebody said earlier like where's the tipping point when it does kind of get unruly out of control what have you um gives us a i agree with that second so good <laughs> i'm good all right we're going to move on to the next item wait a minute Do we need to make uh -oh. i need to know how you voted on that motion um yeah okay thank you yeah, I did say unanimous, but I didn't know. Yeah, I okay. so. And so the draft ordinance that is in your packet will be uh, then voted on after the public hearing of the board on December 7th. And for the wealth of audience, yeah, you just said December 7th. All right, last uh, new business item F, public hearing, adoption of the PDC, an amendment to the code of ordinances for the new, uh, city of Ocean Springs, Mississippi, consolidating and updating the zoning and development regulations. Um, a motion to go to public hearing. Where did mine vote? So moved. I got a motion, Kevin. Second, Marshall. All in favor? Aye. All opposed, nay. No, I'm just kidding. Um, go ahead, Kevin. Okay, so um, essentially the purpose of this is to readopt the UDC. There's no changes to the original UDC except for the ones that I'll discuss in a minute uh, for the RM1 reversion to R1A. Uh, this is presented um, as a uh, based on the order from Judge Krebs on the recent lawsuit. Uh, so it's the existing UDC 
with the reversion, the pages that are give, provided in your packet are the only ones that changed uh, as a result of the reversion from RM1 back to R1A so that we didn't have to print out 385 pages for each of you. <laughs> but those are the only pages that changed. Nothing else did change and the document is available. So there's two different colors. There's the changes made in strike through fashion in red and in gold. The ones that are done in red are the ones that we did prior to the first advertisement of this and the ones in gold were based on public input. Um, we have uh, also been working with the complainant in that lawsuit and uh, their attorneys to ensure that we are following Judge Krebs' order and reverting to the, to the best of our ability from RM1 back to R1A. So that's what's in front of you uh, primarily for the readoption and the reversion. You quick? Well, you can because I'm, that's it. That was <laughs> all I had. Oh, I knew that. <laughs> Stop you, I meant. Um, just to be clear, so we came in today and we have November 7th. I don't remember, it's day the 9th, right? It is. Um, so two days ago, we have a letter from Michael and Julia, and then mm -hmm. we also had this. This Correct. appears to replace what was in our packet. Correct? Yes. I tried to do my best, and it seemed like there was two. There were some minor changes. Um, I mean, just a couple of them, right? What right, just, just a small page. And primarily the reason it's so many pages is that table, those two tables, the 3.5 for uses, we um, included reference. We had, had added a footnote 13, and we just didn't reference it anywhere. So we, it, it really is attached to that table. So the column where it takes out R1A and just tells you to see footnotes 12 and 13. So, you know, I got here a few minutes early. We only mm -hmm. had 15 minutes or so, but it, it, best I could tell, I tried to go to this mm -hmm. and go to this, the new letter, the new packet. Correct. Just make sure that the things that don't say agree or what are changed. In yes, that that's accurate? correct. Okay. That's what I wanted to verify. Everybody understand what I was trying to say? I think so. Yeah, the, the, the ones in gold are all follow up, but there were some additional ones that happened this week with some minor changes. And that's what I was referencing the coordination um, with the Alonso, you know, to make sure that we caught everything uh, moving the reversion from RM1 back to the previous R1A, which was in a different format. So, and to make it dummy proof for me, when if, if we vote to approve it, this would be this plus the parts that aren't reprinted here would be what is okay goes to the board. When, it, when it's presented to the board, it will have just one set of all the changes compiled. Yeah. Right. One more dummy proof question for me. So the UDC, when it goes to the board and all this, these will kind of become officially into the UDC. Well, is that yeah, correct? they they are already. But we've already voted on these. We've already seen them. You're not changing correct. anything that we've already voted on. So that's why we have no like packet that's 30 pages correct. or probably more than that. Okay. Even when when this is all said and done, and you have the final version with all the changes absorbed into it, that that is a table that always stays in the front because it, it references back to the original adoption in 2019 and then everything that's happened since then. So actually the ordinance number that comes from this will be added to that list as ordinances DVDs. that were passed that, that impact the entire well, Actually, you know, will the actual words of general flood regulations be in the UDC or just uh, incorporated by reference number? I'll ask you, it really is. Yeah, there's that that table is on is inside on the first page of the of the UDC document and basically tells you what sections and what were changed by what ordinance at what date. So we're just using the R one A to go ahead and incorporate everything else. Right. Really that's the only change that hasn't come before yeah, body is the reversion yeah. of R one back to R one A. Okay. All right. Um, I do have a question on page twenty. Uh, in the package? So, yeah, for so the Waterview Preservation District. So this is new. It's going in here, right? So it's in gold, so it's a new one. Well, there were some things that were yes. added back from the old code uh, that right. specifically relate to now R1A. Okay. So, so is that, yeah. The, yeah, the gold is new. This is new. Right. I think that would be added. the R1A district. I understand there's like a lot of uh, time and effort on your part assembling this, but is it pretty safe to say the red and gold's kind of inconsequential to us, right? Right. Yeah, that was just the monitor. Yes. As y'all had it, then two it was a public hearing, and they changed some stuff for the public hearing. If it's, it's not in black and it's underlined in bold, then it was added. If it's strike through, then it was taken out. Yes. And well, our our tracking tracking purposes in the house. Red and gold are, are the same to us, and that's what's changed. Yeah. So this has changed. This is gold. 
Yeah, it's being it, added. It's being added, to, that's the being added to the UDC. That it was view preservation district shall not, not exceed 50 feet in height as measured from grade plane, which I assume is the ground. In the R1A district. Right. In the R1A district. Mm -hmm. It's under the section. And those were some things that were in the previous code that uh, just needed to be reiterated specifically for R1A because the format changed or, or something that it wasn't included. I guess my honest question is, this, was this put in here just to get rid of the sands? No, absolutely this not. Was, this was done to, no, this was done to revert RM1 back to R1A. I mean, this was in the... That was in the previous. Previous the zoning previous. regulations. Right. As so you it's see not right new, here. It's, just, it's I mean, not it's new, it's exactly. reverted. And it's, being, it's what's been directed. It's right. Yeah. And it's per the judge's order, the yes. Judge. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's I'm literally trying to make sure there's not something. I would argue. Yeah, no, there's no slip, changes. It's a reversion. In. I guess for a specific purpose. Legally, yeah. it has to be verbatim, correct? Right? Yes, as as much as as possible. There were some places where like, we had to change some add some references. Or or right. Yeah. I'm just trying to confirm. There's no like personal interest for any one development project or no. anything else. It's well, it's, it's interesting that you were asking these questions only because, it's, and, and, and we started in public hearing, I haven't even called for it yet, but I was here for all the UDC, so I forget yeah. that like other people weren't. So like, you know, I recognized it right away, but it's an interesting, I didn't even think about you newer sure, guys make, that are sure really, everything's on the up and up. really coming up. Right, and I said, we've been going back and forth with, with everyone yeah, to make sure that we looked at it in detail I mean, and as, as much as we could. Yeah, so it, 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 it does revert it back. Yes, gotcha. I am clear now. Yeah. All right, so we are in a public hearing. Um, you might want to speak in favor or opposed. You're the last of the public, Mike. I don't want to single you out. <laughs> I'll stand up and say something for him. All right, come on up. Name and address at the podium. Got a limit to three minutes. If you go to four, I'll let it fly. Thank you. You never heard that from me before, <laughs> have you? <laughs> oh my I'm Michael Hahn, uh, 303 from Beach Drive. First, I want to, I, I don't know who was on the other side of the uh, email and the messaging that I was working with on a lot of the writing, but uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate the effort, the way that was uh, handled, the referencing of uh, each clause so we could tie it to the old language and we could see what changes were being proposed. Uh, it was just very well handled. So. Wait, that was you or your attorney? It was all, it was no, all, all of us. It was, uh, that it, was, was a, uh, it was a group effort. By was, all of us. Was, and I, I appreciate that. It made it a lot easier. It looked, you know, very, very familiar. I worked on a lot of contracts and legal documents in the past, and you get into that going back and forth to get things right. And when folks are working hard to make sure that what they're doing is visible, you know, to everyone, it, uh, it makes it a lot easier. So I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to also say I want to be as constructive as positive tonight. I mean, you know, we're, we're, it, it was actually encouraging to watch this group and, and the decision you made on that topic uh, earlier where you were considering a proposal to rezone a property. Uh, I mean, to answer your question specifically, this property, this, this, these properties just may not be the right word, but uh, we're, we're here because there was a decision that was determined to be illegal in rezoning the R1A to RM1. And um, uh, that was done without any evidence of changes to neighborhoods, um, without any evidence of there having been a mistake. So that's that's why we're here. So what we're putting back is what was in place before that decision was made. And, I, and I'll also point out, and I think Andy's point's an important one, uh, for this group's information that all of you are here, the staff, uh, and the planning commission both voted against the spot zoning or rezoning that was overridden by the board of aldermen on a motion by alderman ottawa so that that's why we're here we didn't have to be but i'm glad we're past it and we're beyond it and uh, uh just uh you know for future reference um the rm1 uh is really not a good zoning district for velocity zone properties. It allows very dense, tightly spaced units in a condominium ownership model. And you, you know, you throw in private infrastructure that the city doesn't want to maintain. Um, our Mississippi Gulf Coast is, uh, we experience, and I think Andy probably knows this as a trained civil engineer, we experience the highest storm surges in the United States. And that's because of our geography. 
Uh, we have shallow water for a long distance. We have a long uh, distance between our shoreline and deep water, which mitigates uh, storm surges. Let's keep uh, it on topic, Mike. These type of these type of developments. I am on topics. These type of developments uh, that are in the RM1 uh, don't need to be in the velocity zone. Um, you can imagine what a, uh, a a big storm surge would do to a property that's uh, developed like that. It would be bad for the city. It would be bad for the people that purchased the property. It would be bad for the community that that lives around it. So uh, thank you for your efforts. I uh, um, appreciate that. And I, and I hope, I would like uh, Carolyn to get a chance of looking at the final document. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you guys will be, you know, putting that together. Sure. And when you have a version that uh, we can look at electronically, uh, just to read through it one more time before we go to the board of all of them work there, uh, we'd like to do that. Yeah, we'll share it in the same way that we can have been. All right. Yeah, I want to say something for the record. I was about to say. For the record, Mike is wrong because I didn't do nothing legal. We've been working on the UDC since before Mike even built the house over there. So he can say what he wants to about that, but we've been, we haven't worked on that for a long time. Okay. Noted. All right, I was actually about to say you are technically part of the public today, so I, I misspoke when I said he was the last one. I didn't get his name and address. I didn't get your name and address. <laughs> can you infer? Ricky Automall, 1111 Opera Bill. There we go. Um, all right, we've exhausted the public comment because we've exhausted the public. So I have a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. So moved. Second. Matthew, second. I'm sorry. Is that a second from you? Second. Alan, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. We are out of public hearing and I'll entertain either some discussion or if anybody wants to motion, feel free to do it at your discretion. Motion will be adjourned. <laughs> Maybe a motion on the UDC first. Please. Please. Right. Move on. Let's move on with this. All right. I don't have the depth of experience or history with it, as a lot of you people do, but I'll go for it. Uh, motion to recommend approval of the attached ordinance draft to facilitate readoption of the UDC, including all subsequent approved modifications and reversion of RM1 to the previous R1A requirement. Kind of said it better myself. Motion, Kevin. Second, Marshall. All in favor. Aye. All, right. all opposed. Again, this right. will be re-advertised no, for December seventh in front of the board. To Mike's point earlier, I guess the re-advertisement that would be when you have a completed document anyway, so he would get. Right. Well, it'll, it'll go to the paper tomorrow. Basically, I'll just it, like I said, we've been going back and forth, and there's pieces, but there will be a revised memo that just presents it as one set yeah. of changes. Y'all do you, I'm going to stay out of this for a minute. Okay. Um, all right, so we are down to general public comment. Anybody want to speak to any non-agenda item? Once, twice sold. Commissioner's Forum, anybody want to speak? I'm going to speak, but I'll reserve mine at the end unless... I would just like to give a personal thanks uh, to the planning staff. They always do an excellent job. Bang up job. Thank you very much. Technical. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to, Mike's not going to like me. Um, I'm going to bring up something that I brought up during the UDC and ask again and just put it in the mind of commissioners. Don't do anything with it today. But today we had a item for 201 Front Beach that is an R1 zone that we approved a non-conforming lot because R1 has 100 and this didn't have it. Today we went into uh, 227 Front Beach Drive, lots 1, 2, and 3, which is an R1 zone which had three 70 foot lots, 76, I don't know, it's, you know, 70 something foot lots that didn't have it. Uh, we talked about, you know, the R1 zone on Henshaw. I don't know how that's gonna turn out. I'm assuming the developer did some sort of pro forma, decided he couldn't make money or what have you. We'll kind of put that away, but I don't know if everybody read Donovan's report. Um, he, he does a pretty decent job in that report and it kind of struck me, uh, some of his breakouts on it, it just seems to me, and I said it at the thing, and I'm going to say it again, it seems like our R1 zone is just prohibitively big. And I think that's a terrible idea for propagation of ocean springs beyond our lifetime. Um, everything you see now, I don't know, Alan, if you can speak to this better than me, but uh, smaller lots are in higher demand than larger lots, kind of in general, a lot of millennial type young adults are, are even going almost to townhomes and everything because of lack of maintenance and everything. 
Uh, I didn't see it then, I don't see it now, why the R1 has to be 13.5 and 100 feet wide lots. Um, so y'all just think about that. If anybody agrees with me, let me know and maybe we'll go back at it. But if y'all like them, then we'll keep them. Well, I 100% agree with you. I think you know, we're taking these very general guidelines and trying to make them work in an area that it, it, it doesn't really make sense and what's happening. I mean, that was kind of my point about the even on one hand chalk property. It's just the development that's happening outside of Ocean Springs. It's going to be more of an issue for, I think, Ocean Springs in the future because I think we will eventually be, the city will be part of that and take take that. And we're looking at these things. We're pushing these developments out there because they're, right. and, and I get what you're saying. I'm just, I think these, uh, the density in the city is not but the enemy. I mean, it, it's not, and I don't see why everyone fights it. I don't, I don't understand why we can't, you know, why we can't build on historical flight lots uh, that are in town. If they're already there, there. I don't think there's anybody else come to us. Well, important. like the one I, I was asking you about the one day about if somebody's owned it since the same, for the same period, or since 1985, you can't build on a historical flight lot in a subdivision when there's lots next door to it that are built on those mm -hmm. historical flight lots. Like, why does that make sense? Um, I just don't think we've gone through, and this is kind of to your point, but what, it was, when was the ordinance, the R1, the 80, was it 85? Was it it was mid-80s. It was done over a period of time between the late mid-70s and So kind of like catching, catching the height of urban sprawl. So we, we, we had an ordinance that was made to catch the height of, of suburbia, and, uh, and we haven't looked back at it for 40 years. And we haven't changed it in 40 years. We haven't reacted to anything. Not on that level. Well, no. he, he, uh, Mr. Or Mike talked about the you know, velocity zone and the changing of the landscape and the storms. I mean, you know, the property his house is on, I believe, was a hotel from 1897 to 1969. It was changed by Hurricane Camille. Um, the, the landscape has changed. The, the neighborhoods have changed. Um, the idea that they're not allowed to change and we're not obviously in that change right now where you know density is very much encouraged in the, the area you're talking about it's kind of black you know you don't know about that the thing about it is, is ocean springs the ebb and flow of how the town right now, is changing right. yes there is a need for uh more density property within ocean springs one unique thing about ocean springs is our r1 zoning that's what so many people that come to Ocean Springs that are willing to put a really nice home on a piece of property is the fact that it is how it's done. I, now, you, I would disagree with that. Well, no, 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 I'll keep going. no. I, I mean, I look at Harrison County, Hancock County, uh, all over and everything, and we are the 13,500 on R1. That's very rare. But it's not accurate in the downtown area. It's not accurate because it needs to be looked at over, there needs to be some plan to come out and look at it and say, okay, does there need to be a new zoning and toll for that? But the thing about it is, is when you have other big subdivisions that have come in that have been platted as R1, it's really hard to go around it and say, make smaller subdivisions we, in it. Well, we just talked about the fact, I think tonight, that there aren't. Right. Aren't those subdivisions coming in because it's but I think the tool that we need to look at is come up with a a good plan moving forward on welcoming the density into Ocean Springs. So I got to and and I think maybe the second question or comment I have against you is you just answered. But so for instance, today we denied them to go to R two, which you know, if it was a I think the R two rules should be on R1. That's just my opinion. Right. So if it was like, if that was R1 and R3 was R2, I would agree with that. Now I, you know, well, I guess I voted, but it's different. Hold on. So does the 13.5 go all the way to east? I mean, is, is East Ocean Springs a 13.5 neighborhood? Once you cross over, yeah, let's say, you know, strike it up. Once you cross over Hanshaw right there, you start going into more of your R2. Right. Uh, I mean, you look at Gulf Park States county and everything but that is part of ocean springs you let me ask you this who's buying 13.5 and here, here this is what you i'm trying to prove my first question who's buying the 13.5 who wants to be in those 
the thing about it is you're getting hung up on the whole millennial flip right now. Right. Okay, the kids that were born in the 70s and 90s and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, the Gen X and all. Just, but the thing about it is there is a turning point that I'm starting to see people are wanting more of quality and everything with an Ocean Springs and all over. Okay. Um, looking at what Biloxi has done with their R1 and their densities and everything to what Ocean Springs is. You can't really compare it because of how Ocean Springs is set up. When we have downtown, which is R1, which really should be R2. Should. I would say that but. My hesitancy would be is once you reduce the requirements and allow higher density in smaller lots, you can never go back. Once those houses are built, those mm -hmm. lots are done, you're never going back. Yeah. Nobody's ever going to take two houses, knock them down, combine the lots, and build one house on it. But, no, um, but I think our point, or my point in that, and just talking about it, is like the, the neighborhoods already are. There are already two of those. We're putting, we're retroactively putting them on neighborhoods that weren't 13,500 lots in the first place. You're requiring, in the downtown area. You're requiring you're new subdivisions to meet a code that we really, nobody's ever met. I mean, not ever, that's obviously. Well, I mean, I, I think that's because the code is what we want. This is this is the standard we want. Regardless of what's already been done, in the future, this is the standard we, we want. We put it over an area that it doesn't fit, and that's what makes it impossible for anything to, to then happen. I mean, if we stand to lose 75, $364,000 homes plus tax base and everything else because our one is too restricted. Now, see, when I hear them stand up and talk about demand, I will say if demand is that high, they're going to build something here. They're going to figure out how to do it in R1, and they're going to build something that's going to be beautiful and it's going to be nice. You know, and yeah, maybe they don't get to build five extra houses or they seven might, extra houses or whatever it they is. They might charge more for the ones they're offering. And then, but why is that? You, you're looking at that, I guess, you're thinking it's better that they're on these bigger lots. That's what your point of view is on that, and it fits more in the neighborhood, in that area. In that area. Choice. I but would, we're giving I them that. Buy a house on the largest lot I could afford. Uh, people are buying these small lots because that's all that's being offered. Well, <laughs> because but, that's all they can do. And that's part of the reason that they're not but, building. But my point yeah. is the the boomer, sorry, generation is the one that wants that. But if you go out to Walmart and they got houses on an acre, it's probably hard to find an open. But if you have kids, you're going to live in well, a house. The acre out there is a sewer issue. You have to have an acre of... Well, what I'm saying, though, is people want space. Certain Some people. Certain demographic people want space. So we just eliminate any developer that doesn't want to cater to one group of people? Okay. I mean, you, you I can, don't think... You can do what we've done on all these things. If you, if you don't agree that that particular thing in the neighborhood and where it's going, then you can change down. But every time you do away with one thing, then now you're taking R2s and making them R3s. It just becomes easier and easier to slide down the slope. Okay. Well, I think R2s should be R3. <laughs> but, but like I said with the uh, with that handsaw one, that uh, by the time you put the conservation overlay on it, you're going to end up with an R2 anyway. You started at R1, but it's going to end up as R2, and essentially. I, I, I think that money it up a little bit on the front end, because I agree with you on that. You can't really, it, it's like if we, it, it needs to be a conservation subdivision on the property, but I'm looking at very generally looking at the property, right? You can kind of tell that, and that's what they're going to have to do um, because there's going to be so many wetlands and so many low lying areas. But how do we really count that without that, without looking at the preliminary plat or sketch plat? I mean, uh, it, yeah, I, I'm, I don't think that should have been changed. And I'm not I sure just, if it, it's just me, but I, I, think the I prefer to have more restrictive codes with more individualized variances and exceptions. But, but we don't get variances and we don't accept anything, we don't and anything. we have the only cap on variances that I've ever seen. We have a 25% <coughs> variance cap, and mirror image Biloxi, a 25% variance is approved administratively by the planning director. I mean, I'd be careful. Yeah. Like, I could get a two and a half foot <coughs> setback variance just by saying, Carolyn, I want that. She can just sign it off. Whereas we have to send somebody through two months of meetings, and that's the most you can get. That's another one of my issues, but I brought that up too many times, so I'm saving that one. I like to do this once every six months, really kind of stir the pot real good. But yeah, I also think the variance cap is one of the dumbest things in the world. Well, once you go smaller, you're never going bigger. 
It's well, never going back. Well, you got, you, you know, got I agree with that. On it's once you go one way, it's it's that you can't back up. That's absurd. That you can't, back back you but, can't make the people that built under that code go up. Right, but you but can only look right. at developments all over. <coughs> the thing. But I think something in toll that we're kind of having us, and I think there's some concern and everything. This is a very passionate discussion. Okay, I think we all have our thoughts on it and everything. Something that I think we need to do is put a think tank together on something like this and work with the department and everything and maybe moving forward on it. But I think we're kind of getting the attorney's kind of promotion a couple times that we're getting kind of borderline on. We need to. Well, this is something that we could schedule a workshop on at a future date just for discussion and, you know, um, so we'd be a little more prepared. <coughs> Have some information for you, um, but it, but it has to be public. Enough. Yeah, I mean it would be yeah, advertised and available yeah. to the public. Yeah. It would be a work session, yeah. but uh, that would probably be the appropriate um, vehicle tool to use to to kind of suss these things out to see if there's any recommendations that you all want to make or anything that you would want staff to look into further. Um, but we we'd be happy to you know look at scheduling that probably after the holidays to. Uh, We'll revisit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all think about it. Yeah. I mean, if, if I'm the only one that agrees that it's too big, then there's no sense in doing it. So let's just we'll kill it there. But y'all think about it. We'll talk about it next week. And see I think a good way to look at it is like what percentage of the properties that are actually zoned and are compliant. You know, I mean, that look at that, and then then you decide right there because that's just a fact. You know? I think we um, actually we had done that as part of the UDC. We've mm -hmm. got some maps that that looked at that very thing. Uh, you know, what subdivisions don't comply with the their overlying zoning district especially those that were done before the districts were laid down that is uh, on the schedule um the mayor is, is working forward with that probably next year um i know it's in the budget to do so we are going to be reviewing the comp plan over the next year yeah. but even if it is just one person that thinks it i'd still like to hear about it yeah well let's uh you said you have some you think you have something um, back, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I'd have to, to dredge them up and find them, but yeah, we've got some um, maps of that. I mean, it was primarily subdivisions that were built before the zoning districts were created, and you know, like there's a lot of, especially in the old old downtown area, there's a lot of old subdivisions that that are a lot smaller yeah. than even mm -hmm. the zoning district. So if they established it at R1 and it was too big, that'd be a mistake. In the original zoning. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, yeah, well, <laughs> if that's where you get historically platted legal nonconforming. You know, it was platted well, prior to You can make an argument system. for anything you want, really. Well, yes, you can argue about anything. But. So if you can find some maps or some information, yep. get it to a man. There, were, to there were PUDs before the UDC. There's PUDs until 2015. I think yeah, I was. Approximately, yeah. I was on the planning commission. Stillwater was, Stillwater was the last one. And, I wasn't and here for Sweetwater. The stand, I was only here for the and what were y'all's feelings about this at the time? Or why was that? I'm in favor of them. That they, some of them were implemented outside the parameters of what it was intended uh, prior to you know in years past and I think there was just a perceived problem with it that it was a flawed ordinance and it was voted to rescind it and that's why the conservation subdivision kind of took the place of that intent but which is to allow the same density but flexible lots but if um, like tonight if that property had been tried to be rezoned as a put you know, well, you wouldn't rezone it as a PUD. You would you develop it as so a. So it would still have to go through the initial. Or it would, how would they have done that? Well, there, there's two layers. There's what the zoning district is, and then, like I was explaining, the conservation subdivision uh, overlay, which used to be similar to the PUD as, as an overlay, is just another tool in the toolbox. So if you have have a piece of property like like this one that has a lot of wet areas or potential wetlands on it, it doesn't change the density. The zoning establishes the density. But this would allow you to make some smaller lots and move them out of the right. way. You can change what you want. Right. To so it's a, the the overlay is a development tool, not a zoning tool. You don't zone it as a conservation overlay. You develop it as one. Just, if that makes sense. I don't sense. like things getting muddled up as like project versus property. It, and it's, that's what I find it that we we do that all the time. I mean, right. Anybody's doing any property, they're telling us about the project. Right. Well, and they want to give but you an idea of. What they intend to do, which, if you had a pie, but then they can walk out the door and go do something else. Correct. We give it, that's, that's right. That's why we ask you to look at the worst case scenario so why are because we even let them talk about the property. 
But all they, they can present what they want to present. Party could have kept it R1 within the parameters of what our budget would exist. So he would not have had to resign. We would have had to have seen the project before we You would have. have. That's what I mean. That gives us more with a budget you would. situation. I like a budget. It's because yeah. he's rezoning it and then doing an overlay. They're two different things. And I think we, I didn't say it, it was already voted out before. I just had the last two projects that were approved on it. Long story short, I don't know that it was a very good PUD ordinance. It was not, it, it seemed to have been open. There was several projects done before I moved into this office that seemed to have been taking liberties with it. So it wasn't maybe clear. And that's why it was, I, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't in, in the office at the time, but it was voted to rescind it because some of the developments weren't, they didn't like them the way they turned out. So the intent and spirit of it is what I consider we were able to include in the conservation subdivision, which allowed for flexible lot sizes without increasing density. At the cost of 40% of your land, don't forget that. Yeah, you know, it, 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 because that justifies the ability to make small lots if you're, you only need to be doing it if there is some sort of natural feature, such as wetlands that you're going to preserve. But I guess we're kind of taking the conservation into kind of not versus the PUD where you would see the plan or the, get the general concept of the, well, the, the, but the, PUD, the project before you, would you, you, would, before you resent it. Right. You could get the density increase for, you wouldn't necessarily have to have wetland area or marshland. You could say set aside a large park in the yeah. center of it. Right. Yeah. So it's a tool that is available to any property. So that's why it's not really considered in the rezoning because it is a development tool. So any property can use it. Like Wade said, it might not be because of wetlands, it might be just to preserve an open park area. Mm -hmm. It might be something that they want to use to facilitate. There's a lot of reasons that it might be a tool, but the rezoning is what I would think of as the skeleton of what they can do. So the, the zoning in this case really drives what the density can be, and then everything else is a development tool. All right, so you're going to find some old maps. We're going to get an update from Amanda, and then we're going to decide if it's worth the workshop in the next meeting. Is that good? Everybody cool. okay? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, Kevin. Second. Second, Alan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Y'all can stay here, but it'll be in the dark with the door shut. <laughs> I don't care where you go, but you can't stay.